Hello and welcome to Local Writers Read June event. Uh, I'm Josh Gothier and I'm here with my co-organizer Claire Guyton. And our theme this month is Adornment and Disguise. Um, as anyone who has followed the series knows, um, we pick a theme for each reading and then we invite our readers to interpret it as broadly as they feel like. Um, and Adornment and Disguise certainly fits into that um, with decorations, disguises, false faces, um, but also making things um, dressed up pretty formal. There's a myriad of different ways to interpret this. And so we have two readers tonight and then three more readers tomorrow afternoon who will be sharing um, a variety of forms and styles of work um, based on this theme. And if anyone is tuning in um, for the first time to our series, um, we Local Writers Read spotlights um, main writers from across the state in various genres, forms, and stages of their career. And we operate um, in non-pandemic times in partnership with Quiet City Books in Lewiston, um, who is our, normally our host. And we are also co-sponsored by the Lewiston Public Library. Um, so without further ado, I will hand things over to Claire to introduce tonight's readers, and then we'll dive right in from there. All right, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I am so excited about this theme. Can't wait to hear our readers tonight. We have got Dennis Kamiri, who will uh, we'll get us started. Dennis teaches writing at CMCC and UMA and is the founder of the Portland Poet Laureate Program. So thank you for that, Dennis. His poems have been featured in Poetry East, Mid-American Review, Spoon River Review, Maine Public Radio's Poems From Here, and the Press Herald's Deep Water series. In 2017, Deerbrook Editions published his second book, Combed by Crows. After Dennis, we'll hear from Sue Repko. Sue is a Southern Maine writer, teacher, urban planner, and gun violence prevention advocate. Three of her essays were named Notables in Best American Essays, and one received a Maine Literary Award. Her work appears in Hazlitt, Aquifer, The Southeast Review, Hippocampus, The Common Online, Literal Latte, The Gettysburg Review, Beloit Fiction Journal, and elsewhere. She's finishing a memoir and just about to query agents. So that's very exciting. Uh, Dennis and Sue are good friends of the series. We are so happy to have you back. Dennis, whenever you're ready, please take the mic and share your work with us. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. As you know, my poems tend to be, you know, a little longer than normal. So I'm probably just going to read four poems and maybe just talk a little bit between the poems. This first one is new. And um, this poem really indulges my love for puns and whimsy, even though I think I'm, you know, exploring something that's somewhat uh, profound and deeply emotional. This is called, After Her Ex Takes His Own Life, She Adopts His Cat. As penance at first, for the self flagellants of catnip, happy scratches, pacifying blame over breaking up the night prior to the suicide. Though as the cat prefers her ex's side of the bed, after rubbing his back against that same cracked bathroom trim following a light snack, she's rendered catatonic in imagining the ex-lover perhaps inhabiting this black feline. Now holding the tom to her chest, in weeping apologies for her awful timing so close to his mom's passing, the cat becomes a catalyst for release from her self-imposed purgatory as nothing but perfect purring is returned to her avowed unworthiness. And when her love life reveals the same nine lives, and that monastic cat rubs her new bow's boots the first time they meet, there's nothing mad about this lapsed Catholic, waking at dawn to fill the food dish before another day of this catalytic converter of cat silencing her wounded heart's muffled rumblings. So she doesn't become that crazy old cat lady 
but rather forever owns one black magic cat who miraculously knows when to leap onto her lap to catheter away the heartache's growing acids with the swale of tail or head rub to face before his return to the window's bird feeder morphs the tabby into this lovely slow black Cadillac hearsing away so much hurt or entombing it inside a cat soul's sacred catacomb. People usually like pet poems, so. <laughs> this next one is something that was in the Deep Water series um, over the winter. And it's inspired by, you know, I was moving books around on my bookshelf one night and I woke up the next morning and I saw a three by five card with a quote written down saying, bread is the way sun enters the body. And I was wondering, I wonder which book this fell out of. And I never could find out which book it was. So I just wrote the poem because it wasn't important. So this is called Upon Hearing That Bread is the Way Sun Enters Our Body. I feel this need to need on my knees and praise this daily transubstantiation of sun into whole grain via the Holy Ghost of yeast. And kudos to Eats Pizza, now morphing into these solar systems, holding so many suns of pepperonis, quarter moons of onions, and the light's epic expansion in the running cheese. So chewing a slice, we feel we're ingesting nothing less than the star stuff of Helios. And after we caffeinate conversations with the solar flare, the spied and the eclair, or the northern lights, the spied and the marble rye, consider the sourdough soul's own second rising. When musing how that same sun beams through the doughy body's own celestial abode. So our neurons feel the same heat as those distant rings of Neptune do. And our membranes glow for the same reason as any of the solar system's marvelous moons. And sun, bread, and body are now one grand string-laden cosmos in expansion, heating us surely now to feel delights, vitamin D, as her hand say alights and tans our thigh, or to know the solar radiation of a soul, so freely giving love over to our blue being, which fathoms now how that sacred moment of silence before cracking open the warm loaf is heightened by looking into one another's eyes and recognizing all the sunshine in disguise. Yeah, I hope those two fit the adornment theme, right? I think I'm hitting it this time, ain't I? <laughs> Here's one I wasn't gonna read, but then I realized this is adornment. Damn, damn, damn. Okay. This is called the hairdresser's retirement speech. And I often write poems where I try to find the sacred, like Neruda did in the common, you know? I try to see the sacred in jobs and professions where we don't normally see art and sacredness and beauty and aesthetics. The hairdresser's retirement speech. Soon here turned into my muse. As dying the old ladies thinning grays, I became Picasso during his blue stage. While lathering locks and visualizing the coming trim, I was that brooding potter seeking a Ming dynasty vase in the warm clay. 
and fluffing and trimming the bachelor's comb over, just enough for him again to ride the white steed of his self-esteem? Wasn't I heeding that poet's advice that art inspire one to more deeply inhabit their life? But ah, true, sometimes even our conditioner-laden collaborations failed to attain a Blakeian vision for all here kind, despite the crossed dowsing rod of scissors and comb, trying to divine your old high school hairdo described as beautifully bridging head and heaven. Still, most days, how joy did twirl in her short red skirt. In my perfect Peruvian weave, debuting your own Incas goddess beauty. As next visit, you beamed about the cut, rousing you to seize the dance floor. Or the first date's kiss, after his fingers became entangled in our sunflower cut curls double helix. Give then, girls, your head to your new dresser, knowing the bidden perm provides the same raison d'etre as Michelangelo's stone did to his soul. So each month you're cut free of the split ends of a belief that most of us are not pursuing some Keatsian beauty and truth in our blue collar lives. And the follicle of this thought lead you to espy the landscaper's Van Gogh of violets planted on the library lawn, or to see the stock boy's Mayan pyramid of navel oranges evincing the Fibonacci sacred mean, or to smile at the plumber who, after snaking the drain free of your hair, insists you kneel with him over the bath's tabernacle to listen for the returned flows, one beautiful John Cage-like note performing inside the tub drain's throat. What do I have for time? Um, about five more minutes. Okay, I'll just do one then. <laughs> This last one, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still tweaking all of these. I'm doing all new stuff. Um, <clears throat> this one uh, is really close, and it's inspired by an article I was reading about. You know how we're, you know, you know how darkness is becoming extinct. You know, water is becoming extinct. Um, basically, this guy was an audio recorder. And he was really curious about how silence is becoming extinct. And he was going deep into the Northwest forests. And, you know, at times during the day when the birds weren't singing and other critters weren't calling, he was trying to find silence. So he was camping out. He was going inside hollows of old growth trees. And he had his satellite dish and he was trying, he was picking up the amount of sound he was picking up from all these areas and he's trying to find places where it's the quietest or where it might actually be quiet. So I became really intrigued with this search for silence. You know, as writers, we're all searching for that too, I think. The student of silence. There's an epigraph from Psalm 65.2. To you, silence is praise. The student of silence. Though nearly extinct, he notes silence still survives by hibernating inside stones, or like the otter, by spending half its life underwater. And he opines about cell phones being the antichrist of silence, extirpating this lovely snow leopard from the soul's blinding white Himalayan peaks. Still, those who believe complete quiet is as fictitious as the Sasquatch now experience it in the newborn's first gaze, grazing their teardrop-awed eyes. 
And soon his research proves silence still produces inside the fiery forests of church candlelight or in museums where lovers steer in wonder at Van Gogh's color carnival. But what's more inspiring than him, waxing poetic on silence being the soul's way of interrogating lovers to see if they're compatible, is how this quilt of quiet settles over the audience when he posits a possible Shangri-La of silence where one might sense between breaths the sublime presence of a wild herd of nothing heard. Hear now how some leave his talks dedicating themselves to a life of silence until, like master monks, they can sit alone in the cave for months in grasping that silence is nothing less than prayer, praise, and the trigger to receive grace. And listen, too, of the healers providing the medicinal benefits and simply imbibing the placebo of rendering oneself for a day completely mute. So maybe we need pause now for that moment of silence, for lovers now pausing to imbibe the silence between heartbeats, or for the old couples who know quietly listening is the highest form of loving, or for the way now all of us are dreaming of a lost epoch where silence roamed as large as buffalo herds on the Great Plains. And we now snow angel in the storm to feel silence accumulate with each inch. And we seek out that old growth hollow, hollows soundproof museum where silence is on display in each exposed wood grain and ring. And we hover sometimes over the butterfly who quietly blooms her body, that aerodynamic flower, while flying so fervently through the perfect silence of sunlight. That's it for me. I think I saved a minute. I reserve the balance of my time for our next reader. Sue Repco. <laughs> Take it away, Sue. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was tremendous, Dennis. I'm, I'm so glad I got to hear you say, do all that in your own voice. Um, wow. I'm looking forward to talking about it later. Uh, so this is a, a personal essay. Um, I write a lot of essay and memoir, and uh, here's something um, kind of old, new. I worked on it a while ago, but uh, haven't uh, published it or even really sent it out. Um, so here we go. Uh, when Elton saved my life. In a photo album at my mom's house, there's a picture of three of my siblings and me in various poses inside and outside our country squire station wagon. One of those long behemoths with imitation wood paneling on the sides, which was parked in front of our house. The photo appears to have been taken in the spring of 1973 when I was 10 years old. On the far left is my sister Daria, 11 years old, barely visible, but seemingly smiling in the back seat. Next to her is our youngest brother, Joe, five years old, in dark shorts and a striped t-shirt, leaning against the rear passenger door with his hands locked behind his head in a master of the universe pose and a smoldering look on his face. Next is Carl, nine years old, turned sideways in the front passenger seat, one hand gripping the lowered window. And then there is me, right elbow leaning on the door frame next to Carl's hand, right ankle crossed over the left, totally at ease. My long orange hair is parted on the side and swooped over. I'd bunched up the sleeves of my plain gray sweatshirt, 
It hung loosely over my dark denim jeans. I was wearing sneakers and a big smile. Back then I was known as and called a tomboy. I look like I'm happy and comfortable in my body in those clothes, but I had slender limbs and knobby joints and hated sleeveless shirts. It seemed to me that my shoulders were too broad, jutting out too far, and then there were those skinny arms dangling from them. When I was younger than I was in that photo, my father used to mock them, holding my arm up by the wrist and calling me skinny mini. It infuriated me, the insinuation of weakness, and led to my delivering a flurry of punches to his tensed up bicep, which thoroughly delighted him. From a very early age, I wanted to be a boy, to do and be whatever they were allowed to do and be. I had gotten a message from my parents that girls were kind of second-class citizens. In a family that eventually had six children, I appeared on the scene after my two older sisters. As the story goes, my parents were hoping I'd be a boy, their first son. Alas, they would have to try again, finally succeeding 13 months later when Carl was born. But well into adulthood, I affectionately, sarcastically signed special occasion cards to them with all my love, Sue, your third daughter. I was not yet five years old in September of 1967 when I started kindergarten at the public school a block from our house. At recess, the boys in their pants and shirts sprawled across the floor and built wide and tall precarious structures out of blocks, while the girls in their dresses played in the pretend kitchen on the other side of the room. Then when Mrs. Giles plunked out the tune on the piano that signaled the end of recess, one of the boys got to bulldoze the blocks with a big Tonka truck. I wanted to be the one just once to get behind that truck and build up some speed and ram it into the small city that the group had spent the whole recess building. The impact, the chaos, the noise. The boys took turns somehow determining who would be the lucky one on any given day. I didn't understand how their system worked, but I wanted to be part of it, this world of movement and action. Instead of an outside observer in a stupid dress stuck in front of a wooden stove pretending to heat up invisible SpaghettiOs. But it's possible that I'd already decided well before kindergarten that boys were destined for more exciting lives than girls and I'd been cheated, pure and simple. Around this time, after a fight at home with Carl, I was reprimanded by mom and went outside to sulk and pace on the front patio. To me, it was so obvious that Carl had gotten away with something again, just because he was a boy and the firstborn son. So obvious. When Johnny Cash popularized the song, A Boy Named Sue in 1969, I was six years old and my parents teased that that was my song. Never mind that it's about a young man who is murderously angry at his absent father for giving him a girl's name, thus subjecting him to a life of taunts and cruelty. But it may have sealed some sense of myself. There was something boyish about me that was recognizable to others and acceptable except when I was forced to wear dresses to church and a school uniform. For as long as I could remember, this was the narrative running through my head, and I figured I'd show everyone that I was just as capable, just as strong as any boy at anything. I discovered I could make my body move athletically. I could study how a very quick and agile boy my own age fainted and darted away from everyone in a game of pickup football and found I could do it too. As I got older, I began deliberately taunting bigger boys in the neighborhood and at school, and then I darted away. I was a pretty fast runner by then and loved to be in motion and the thrill of the chase. Sometimes I got away and sometimes I didn't. I don't remember exactly when I became aware of Elton John, but it may have been during the same year that photo was taking a, taken of me slouching against the station wagon. In 1973, he released the Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album, which contained the eponymous hit, as well as Benny and the Jets and Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, which were regularly being pumped out of the radio in the bedroom I shared with my younger sister, Michelle. The alienation and raw energy of disaffected male youth spoke to me. Oh, don't give us none of your aggravation. We've had it with your discipline. Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. Get a little action in. My siblings and I and other kids in our neighborhood began to be consumers of Teen Beat and Tiger Beat, pop culture magazines for young people that we could get at Woolworths. And it was likely that was where I first saw Elton John in a pair of oversized glasses, glittery, feathery. 
Without those magazines, he was only a voice coming over the airwaves. And then it was, wow, this dude is outrageous. Of course, there was Kiss and David Bowie and Mick Jagger too, but for me, Elton was always the most spectacular and his music and Bernie Taupin's lyrics spoke the most clearly to me about love gone wrong or out of reach and also just their kick-ass rock and roll. For Christmas 1974, I got Elton's Greatest Hits album and I monopolized the record player in our living room for hours, pressed against the dry sink in which it sat, trying to understand and memorize every word. I think there was information about joining the Elton John fan club inside the album. So on that winter break, in between basketball practices, I began writing a letter to him, propped up in bed, knees drawn up, scribbling furiously on a pad of paper. It was supposed to be a relatively short letter about the circumstances of my life, along with my deepest thoughts, hopes, and dreams. I stopped writing when it got to about seven single-spaced, double-sided handwritten pages, but I felt confident that once he received my missive and read it, he too would immediately feel the bond between us. We were soulmates. He just didn't know it yet. I didn't reveal to anyone that I was writing this letter, but I must have gushed about Elton a bit too much to my cousin, Bill, who was my age. While standing in our kitchen, he blurted out, he's gay, you know. I must have looked stricken because he added, well, actually he's bisexual, which did make me feel better. We still had a chance. I stopped writing the letter though. In the end, it was really a kind of journaling and eventually I tore up those pages. The act of writing had served a more important purpose. It had helped me express myself to me. In the summer following seventh grade, some of my siblings and I began spending a lot of time in the neighborhood of my new best friend, Karen Brennan. Our dad had unintentionally shot our next door neighbor just a couple months earlier and the man had later died. For me, the Brookside neighborhood provided a welcome escape. Karen had three brothers and they all love sports. So we played pickup basketball, touch football and baseball with other neighborhood kids all summer long. Whenever it rained or got too hot, we settled in for long lazy games of pinochle on their front porch. When Karen got Elton's Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy album, we headed inside to the record player in their living room, leaning into the speakers, concentrating hard, listening again and again to someone save my life tonight singing along until we deciphered every line. I became aware of language working on different levels and I wanted to know what it all meant, like really meant. Altar bound, hypnotized, sweet freedom whispered in my ear. You're a butterfly and butterflies are free to fly. Fly away, high away, bye bye. Some nights that summer, I woke up with chest pains. Sometimes it hurt to take a deep breath. Sometimes it hurt just lying still. I got up once just before daybreak and made my way to my parents in the gray light and told them haltingly in several different phrasings that it hurt to breathe. I'd placed second in an oratorical contest at the Elks Lodge a few months earlier, but language failed me then. They tried to comfort me with a mumbled diagnosis of growing pains and urged me back to bed. It didn't matter that there were seven other people in the house. I was alone again, except for Elton's voice running through my head. I never realized the passing hours of evening showers, a slip noose hanging in my darkest dreams. In the spring of eighth grade with Karen's help with my costume, I performed as Elton in our Catholic school's talent show wearing the highest platform shoes we could find, sparkly sunglasses, glittery New Year's Eve top hat, polyester shirt with a crazy pattern and oversized pointy collar and polyester bell bottoms. I carefully teetered onto the stage to lip sync, don't let the sun go down on me, pouring my melodramatic soul into every gesture ending on my knees. I knew I was attracted to guys at that point, but I still wanted to act and dress as I damn well please. Elton's persona, his celebrity, and the acceptability of dressing and behaving outside of gender norms for the sake of entertainment all made him an acceptable cover for a hetero female athlete, unpredictably veering between butch and feminine expressions of herself. As an eighth grade graduation gift, my parents and Karen's parents bought us tickets to what would be my first ever concert, Elton John at the Spectrum for one of his Philadelphia Freedom concerts in that bicentennial year of 1976. Karen's dad took us. 
We had seats on the floor and quickly stood on our chairs where we would remain the rest of the night. I felt the joy of being part of a community, thousands and thousands of people that admired and loved Elton as Karen and I did. I'd never been in the midst of a crowd like that before, singing along with strangers, entranced by the spectacle of Elton, the costumes, the lights, the showmanship. Cops were there in force. At one point off to our left, they cleared a path down an aisle for some paramedics who carried someone out on a stretcher. I assumed an overdose. We'd heard about LSD and heroin in the news. But I felt in that moment like I was being let in on the vastness of the world, how inexplicable it could be, the way people could defy boundaries and expectations, be filled with such joy, but also how danger still lurked in the shadows. Fear shuddered through me, a rumble that had nothing to do with the vibrations pulsing from the stage. Someone was in a bad way, like our neighbor had been less than two months ago. He hadn't made it with this person. But in the next instant, I pushed the continued sorrow and confusion away, turning back to the stage to shout, sing at the top of my lungs with my newfound family for the night. Oh, Philadelphia freedom, shine on me, I love you. Shine the light through the eyes of the ones left behind. Shine the light, shine the light. Shine the light, won't you shine the light? Philadelphia freedom, I love you. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I just, I think Josh or I say some version of this every single time, but I just can't help myself. So I'm gonna say it again. Uh, we love these themes. Um, we've occasionally talked about whether we should, um, you know, try a different way of organizing the readings and do away with themes, but I'm not sure we'll ever be able to do that because we just love how um, the work comes in and it's and it interprets the theme that we've provided that framing we've provided so completely differently. It's so fun and it's so satisfying to see the range of work that that produces and, and once again i'm really satisfied and excited about what we're hearing I just completely blown away by it actually, thank you so much, both of you. Um, so i'm going to go ahead and kick off our our chat portion of the evening by asking uh, you a question, Sue. It's really more a thought than a question. Um, I, so I have a, one of my best friends is also a memoir, memoirist and essayist. Um, and I'm just, I'm just so blown away by, by really good personal essays and memoir whenever I read her work, whenever I hear your work. Um, it amazes me that you can be so vulnerable on the page. You know, I've, I've done a little bit of that writing myself and it, I find it just too uh, painful to be that transparent. Um, I prefer to bury my issues in fiction. <laughs> um, and so, but I was just thinking, you know, with your work when you talk about first the little girl or the teenager, I guess the adolescent, you know, you, you poured your heart out in that journaling and that sort of, um, you know, that's a, that's a predictor of the writer that you would come to be. Um, but you were doing that for yourself. And then in the eighth grade, you plop yourself on a stage in a crazy outfit and lip sync to <laughs> Elton John, which is a kind of performance I cannot imagine my eighth grade self ever doing. And it just strikes me as that maybe that same impulse, that ability to be vulnerable in front of your peers, that ability to express yourself put yourself out there, you know, in a, and maybe even a need to do that, to sort of um, put your anxieties and confusions and, and questions right out on a stage. And so it just struck me that that was another version of what you're doing with your essay writing and your memoir writing. Uh, and I just wanted to hear what you thought about that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I well, hadn't thought about sort of the inner and outer workings of those two different activities of journaling and the Elton John performance. Um, the thing that's not in this piece that maybe should be in some way, um, where I, as I keep working on it, is um, I, I was always a ham and a comic. So when I was in like fourth grade, I loved Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett. You know, and to me, it was like, here, these women have their own shows. They are funny, they're out there. And um, I, I was that kid also. So, uh, you know, I know we 
I, I I like to spend a lot of time by myself and I really need time to process things and do my and write. Uh, but there is also a performance side of me that I know a lot of other writers don't share that, you know. Um, so to me, doing the Elton John thing, I don't know that I felt it was risky, except that I wondered if my teachers would like yell at me or not like that I was <laughs> being so ostentatious. Um, um, you know, uh, to me, it was, it was fun and it was kind of me hamming it up, you know, so. <laughs> well, this is obviously a very small data set, but my, um, the memoirist friend I mentioned mm -hmm. had um, a career before her memoir writing where she did songwriting and performed in New York bars. She would go around and, um, and sing uh, her, her original songs. So there seems to be like, I'm gonna have to start asking the memoir writers and SAS friends if they all have this performance side of them, you know, that that's always kind of a part of what drives that kind of writing or maybe, maybe you just need to be able to be a little bit of a ham to be able in some part of you to be able to be vulnerable like that on the page. I don't know, but I love it. Yeah, I, I mean, I wrote fiction for 10 or 15 years before I really discovered personal write essay and memoir writing. So, and you know, I was, wor I feel like I was working things out through fiction, you know what I mean? And I still think, right, that's a, you know, you're trying to create art and create a universal experience, something others can relate to. And so, um, I don't know if I have that gear anymore. I've tried to write fiction in more recent years and I sometimes feel like, oh, why don't I just write an essay? <laughs> you know, and I, I kind of abandon it. I feel like I, I'm, I'm not sure I have confidence in that gear anymore in myself. It's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm just always so curious about the, the forms people are drawn to. Because like as writers, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, I think so often we're tackling very similar themes, but like I have so much respect for nonfiction writers who can, like, like Claire said, be that vulnerable on the page, which is something that I find difficult to write. And it also is kind of terrifying to me to think about doing that. Um, and poetry is something I've dabbled in, but it, at the same time, it's, it's a form that I have heard wonderful work in, but it's very challenging for me to, to capture things in that way. Um, so it's it, just seeing how we, we start from similar places. And even like Claire said, with the themes, like we're starting from a core idea and then it looks a million different ways in um, artistic expressions always. It, it's so much fun to see what people do with that and how we keep kind of plumbing new depths of common human experience definitely you know which um you mentioned the themes that brings me to the question i had for dennis um you, you had such a sort of wide range of subjects in the poetry that you read and i thought it would be fun if you talked about how you interpreted the theme when you chose one or more of your if you just want to focus on one uh, but you can also talk about more of those poems. So, I mean, I can, I can tell you why, why I, the connections I saw, but I would love to hear, get a little peek behind the curtain and hear um, mm. your thoughts about how you connected the theme to the poems you selected tonight, or one of them, like I said, if you want to only talk oh, about Oh, well, when, when, you, when you sent out the notice of the dates and the themes, I chose adornment because it, it's kind of, my wheelhouse <laughs> it's pretty much everything I write about I'm looking you know if you're familiar with Pablo Neruda's odes he's always elevating the seemingly commonplace and that's what I like to do I like to see these sublime moments that are all around us you know this woman adopts the cat of the boyfriend who killed himself and there's something incredibly sublime in that and, you know, this hair, you know, when, you know, hairdressers, you know, they, there's a sublime aspect to what they do. And there's a consciousness of it that we don't talk about or recognize. So I just think everything I write about is, you know, silence, you know, silence is sublime. But we were, we're very happy to, you know, extirpate silence, which is what we're currently doing. 
we're, 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 we're making darkness extinct and silence extinct. And now in Maine, we're working on making water extinct <laughs> with the drought. And uh, so I just think everything I write about, particularly in my last book, it's all about seeing the beauty or the sublime connection or the deep communion that we often overlook. Um, I don't know if that helps or makes sense to you, but. So are you saying that you, you feel like your work is the adornment to life, to the life experiences that you, you have? Like yeah. You're, yeah, okay. That's interesting. So I wouldn't have, I would have um, gone in the other direction. I, think. I was making connections that, mm -hmm. you know, how the cat is an adornment to the, that woman's life. Oh yeah, That's the cat is. Yeah, okay. no, the, okay. the cat so it's is. Sort of, it's a, like a feedback loop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the cat in that poem is definitely a cat that becomes the sublime, you know, the, the, the Egyptians, uh, you know, so many great lines you have to rip out of your poems. <laughs> and the Egyptians, you know, they actually had, a, you know, cats were revered. There were priests who, you know, embalmed and buried cats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and so I'm, I'm partaking in that lost tradition although it's being resurrected quite nicely. I know a lot of people who are obsessed with cats. So yeah, that, that is definitely in that poem. Definitely, um, yeah. sure. I, I just, I love the line. What I was thinking was the line about the former lover maybe inhabiting the cat. So yeah. I was thinking of the cat, you know, as a kind of disguise, the yeah. disguised lover, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, which is also you know, Native Americans and, uh, you know, there are a lot of cultures that believe that you can inhabit, you know, an animal form for certain purposes, certain sacred rituals. And um, yeah, I'm definitely playing into that too. So yeah, I hope it worked. It's a fun poem to read. Um, very, very enjoyable to read that little poem. <laughs> Well, we loved hearing it. And nobody has to convince me that cats are sublime. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't live without cats. So. I'm, a, I'm one of those crazy cat ladies in the making. <laughs> um, so I'll offer up real quick for anyone who is tuned in live on Facebook. If you have comments or questions um, for our readers, I'm watching the chat here. So feel free to drop those in and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, Dennis and Sue both, we don't have any questions so far, but um, Jody and Deborah, um, both friends of the series are in, in the comments, sh just sharing some of their appreciation of the, the lines and the pieces that were read tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 they were definitely well received by our audience. Of course. Thank you. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, please, I was just gonna say, it, um, if either Dennis or Sue has any questions. I wanted to ask Dennis a question because in the in your second poem about bread and the sun, the last line I think has the word disguise in it, and I wondered, did you revise the poem? Did that line come up as a result yeah. of this theme, or is already there? Oh no, I, I wrote this 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 poems in my book, Comb by Crows. Okay, but I pulled I pulled a bear and worms her, and after it got published, I. <laughs> I took out like 14 lines and I made it tighter. Um, so this, no, this is actually, um, yeah, the, the, this version has been this version for about six months. Mm. Yeah. So I, yeah, I thought it did fit in with the, the theme of adornment and disguise and yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Dennis, I, I was curious, um, your last poem about silence, uh, one of the things that I find so striking about poetry in particular, how it, it is how it can start with such a small kind of idea, and then poems evolve into all these really vivid images. Um, so if you don't mind, can you talk a little bit about, you said that it started from um, the person who was searching for silence. Yeah. The poem branches out into so many other places. What was it like yeah. kind of discovering that? Yeah, that's a good question. This poem, I shared this poem with uh, David Moreau and Jay Franzel a couple weeks ago, and they gave it the green light. So I was like, okay, I, 
I don't know this, this poem was just like a gift. I, I had, it's a poem I didn't want to finish because I was, I just was getting so much out of it. I, I don't know. I, it's silence is something I've thought about. You know, I meditate. Um, and um, yeah, it just, the poem just kept going. I, 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 I just followed it. And I had a couple different endings. And I mean, I started working on this a year and a half ago. Most of my poems I work on for six months to 20 months. And then I throw 90% of them out. And then the 10% I keep, I publish 3%. So as I was telling the Maine Poet Society, they, they invited me to be a judge. I'm like, you know, 98.5% of my poems go make it in the trash can. So, you know. <laughs> And I also don't win poetry contests. So if I didn't select your poem, I, I'm, I feel closer to you than the people. But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know. Th yeah, this, this poem just, uh, I don't know. I, I, it, it just happened. It just kept, I found something that kept growing. You know, when I talk about writing, I tell students, you know, it's like dating. You know, you get an idea for a poem, you're inspired. It's like, wow. I went on this blind date, it was awesome. But you still don't know if anything's gonna happen until you meet them the second time. So you go out, you, so you go to the page, you start writing the second day and it's like, oh, the excitement's still here. And with this poem, it was like day three, day four, something just kept unfolding and unraveling. And I just, uh, I just went with it. Yeah, stories work like that for me too. Like I'll I'll get um, a first line, or um, a line of conversation, or an image, or an ending. Um, you know, the the very ending and a last line, and then I just have to keep coming to the page. And as long as I'm interested in it, I'll keep yeah. throwing things down and trying new things. And sometimes I also will write, you know, thirty pages throw. Uh, 28 of them out and and then keep going yeah. and until I figure it out like I have to write my way to the ending or I have to figure out why that opening line mm -hmm. works and you know it's just such a it's such a fun exploration uh, but you mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to let the work sort of develop itself in a way on the page yeah. um, I know mm -hmm. like people people ask me uh, about those kinds of comments they, they sound uh, silly, I think, to people sometimes because it, it sounds like you're suggesting it's this mysterious thing that happens outside of you, and it. Uh, but mm -hmm. but that's kind of how it feels that you're you're just a conduit for imagining what is what this thing wants to be, and you have to sort of let it become what it wants to be, and not not control it, but so much. If you try to control it too much, it'll mm -hmm. never be good. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like other writers understand that, but um, it's kind of hard to articulate how a poem or a story or an essay, you know, takes its right life and um, and you figure out when you're done with it, which is which, I, you know, can be hard too. I, it's so funny mm -hmm. that you actually published a version of that poem and then thought, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm actually not done with that. And I've done that yeah. with stories. I've mm -hmm. published a story or two and then go, oh, you know what? I stopped a little bit oh. too early. There's there's a, another yeah. few lines that need to go there. Yeah. 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 Do you feel that way about essays, Sue? Yeah, I, I definitely feel that way. I mean, to me, this idea of letting a story or a poem or an essay become what it wants to become, you know, it's all in a, for me, right? It's an associative process. So I have to let the memories, I have to let words, phrases, ideas, I have to let my mind jumped to those things. And for, for an essay um, or memoir writing, you know, where you're often trying to convey the past and also make sense of it, though I, I trust those associations. They, they are trying to tell me these things are linked. Things that happened over periods of time along a theme or at a place or with a certain person, they are linked in some way. And those thoughts are coming into your head because you're your mind and body is telling you that they belong together somehow. And my job is to, yeah, keep coming back to it till I think, I think it really means, I think it means this. I think this is what I want to say, you know, um, is it really what I, what I want to say or how I remember it? Or I'm, you know, I'm molding it to be something that somebody else can also experience and 
it makes sense to them, you know. So yeah, I, I would I I think these are all similar processes. Hmm. On a sort of unrelated note, with your writing, I did notice it's so concrete. Every word is necessary. It's 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 very much like poetry. There there there's really not a word that didn't do something in terms of work and meaning. It was very condensed and distilled. And yeah, the, the prose was just clear, crisp, tight description, wearing a smile and sneakers. That's great. That's all you need to know. You've got like, you've got this head to toe coverage that is so appropriate. Wearing, you know, wearing sneakers and a smile. Boom, that's all we need to know. So I thought the writing, your writing had, it, it was very poetic. It had that compression. Every word was necessary and poignant. It was really wonderful. Good, good oh, stuff. Thanks, because I have been, um, I, I occasionally write poems. They often just stay private, but a few I've let out thanks. into the world. But as I'm, as I get older, I think more like I need to know more about poetry. And as a teacher, I've I've had to teach more. And but I feel like I don't really. I think I'm like maybe Josh mentioned like it's just it's a form that I hadn't was never really formally schooled in, you know. But um, but I like the compression of the language and the concision, and it's just like in every word doing. Mm -hmm pulling its weight, you know? But, but not, but, but saying you don't know what poetry is, is actually an advantage because, you know, you, you might actually write poems that have some sort of unique aesthetic to them. And I, 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 I think it's good, you know, like I still don't really know what a poem is. And I think that's a good thing because it allows these hitherto aesthetic forms to manifest and these other ways of expressing beauty to come into being because I haven't colonized it with this scaffolding it must mm -hmm. be this 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 so you obviously know more than enough about literature to just let yourself go and whatever happens let it let it happen thanks <laughs> thanks that's that's, <laughs> cool. that's cool and fun to hear yeah thanks <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting to me that we write all four of us fairly different types of things, um, but talk, all of us I think echoing that idea of discovering discovering something in the work as we go. Because I know I, I've read and heard of writers who are very aware of themselves as constructing the literature, and to hear them talk about it, it doesn't sound like that kind of intuitive thing like they set out to build something and they put it together piece by piece yeah. um and i think i've heard echoes of it from all three of us that like i know i've gotten halfway three quarters of the way through writing something and then stopped and be like oh that's what this is actually about and like <laughs> I, I knew the plot and i knew the characters i knew like the framework of it but i'd get pretty deep in and then be like the underneath all of that there's something else going on that I was not aware of and like the characters were already pursuing it and dealing with it and it was already there but then to be aware of it as a writer um mm. that intuitive discovery process is so fascinating because like we are creating things we are working at, at this art but there is something kind of bigger or su subconscious going on there as well well I like what um so you you put your finger on it when you use the word associative. You said it's an associative process, mm. and that that's exactly right. That's you know it's like it's your brain is like saying hello. This is why I'm making you think of this and this over here. They're linked. Find the link, mm. you know. And sometimes it takes us a while to to realize that it, that our brains are telling us that, and then you know, and then we dig and find the link. Like you said, I thought you put your finger on it perfectly. That that's I think exactly what we're doing whenever we're trying to shape this material into something. Um, one day we'll have to all talk about exactly how we do know when, when something is done or when we have decided we're about 98% certain that it's done because I'm not sure if I'm ever 100% certain. Yeah, well, I, I, know, I know I've heard it said that, that art is never done, we're just done with it. Yeah. Um, it seems like the most accurate description of the process I can think of because I know I could tinker 
with word choice and mm-hmm. very small things forever, but eventually it has to go be free on its own. I had a writing mentor who said, um, I, I told her once that I was just so bored with the, the stories I had written. I said, I'm just so bored by them. I don't know if I can even stand to send them out. Hmm. I should just throw them away. And she said, no, no, you're bored because they're done. There's nothing left hmm. to, to get you excited about uh-huh. it. That's exactly when you stop hmm. and start sending them out. Hmm. So, interesting. Like that. Yeah. I try to believe her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we are coming up on time. Um, Sue or Dennis, any final thoughts before we wrap up for the night? No, just no. Yeah. yeah, thanks. It was great. This was wonderful. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope I contributed and great to be here. Great to share. Yeah, great to hear your work, Dennis. And um, Josh and Claire, thanks again for yeah. inviting me here. And uh, the discussion was really really interesting too and fun thank you yeah. Th- thank you both for coming um i know claire and i just say this over and over but being able to run this series and just connect with so many writers um people who have come back to join us as you both have and then every season we're meeting and bringing in new people as well that we're able to connect with um and i mean maine's literary community is just so delightful mm. and it's fun to connect with people and just mm. talk people um it's it's really it's an honor to be a part of all this so it, it's been very fun to be able to do what we do here now are um, you ever going to get back into the bookstore yeah we'll, we're looking at the numbers we're looking at the situation we definitely okay. want to get back in person and huh? see people um the virtual has been nice it has its benefits yeah. of bringing people together from kind of all mm-hmm. over but yeah that live and in-person reading um i think by next year definitely we're looking to pull some events together back in quiet city um so we're, we're looking forward to cool. that okay yeah very much yeah. so yeah um but yeah i think that brings us to a close um sue and dennis thank you um to anyone who okay. tuned in um, thanks for listening tonight. This will be up on YouTube as um, uh, as all of our videos are. And tune in tomorrow at three o'clock. We have three more yeah. readers um, on this theme and we'll be sharing more work and having more conversations. So um, invite anyone who would be inclined to listen. And until then, enjoy your evening and your weekend and we'll be back. All right, Thank great. You. Thanks. See you. Thanks. Thanks. thanks.